Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get cracking in our Father's Word in the 22nd chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs being the rules of life telling a human being how to be successful and in three categories. And that is to say in your... Uh, association with the government, your business to be a prosperous success, and your own personal life, uh, even with religion, telling you how to, to um, always succeed, uh, even with difficulty and problems, how to handle them. It's an excellent book. I hope you're enjoying it. Okay, we come to the 22nd chapter and the 12th verse. Uh, let's just get right into it with a word of wisdom from our Father. This particular chapter having to do with um, the um, uh, personal character of an individual helping you build yours. Okay, let's go with it. Verse 12, and it reads, The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. In other words, he confuses the transgressor or anyone that would come against someone that has knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and that is not knowledge and wisdom of the world, but knowledge and wisdom of our Father. All true wisdom comes for, from Him. Why? He knows what tomorrow brings. He planned it. And that's what you need to plug into is through His Spirit to be able to discern uh, the events that transpire and be a victor over them in Him. Verse 13. The slothful man, the lazy man, saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. In other words, a lazy person is always making excuses why they can't get out there and hunt for a job. A lion might get them on the way, and probably a lion hadn't been seen on those streets for years. Uh, in other words, always has a reason why he can't do. And that's typical lazy person. And as you've learned from Proverbs, God is not fond of lazy people. He can't use them. Verse uh, 13, 14. The mouth of strange women is a deep pit. Now the word here for woman is zur, which is one of our own kind Christian that is an apostate. That means has gone over to the traditions of men. And that's man or woman. It simply means an apostate that, uh, that is steeped in traditions rather than, and probably is biblically illiterate, can uh, dig a pit for you by listening to their great words about religion. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. In other words, abhorred by God, why? Because they usually teach against God's word thinking they are for it. It's a sad situation when somebody that is biblically illiterate uh, leads a flock into, the, into that pit of traditions. Verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. In other words, discipline or disciplining your children uh, takes foolishness. That's the, I would rather think of it more in a malicious sense. Uh, things that will, as he matures in life, will lead him into the pitfalls and shortcomings that uh, this old world has to offer under Satan's directions, or that is to say, the prince of this world's direction. And uh, again, the word rod is used, and it simply means that you discipline. Never punish a child when you're angry, and always make certain that you explain to a child exactly why they are being disciplined and even to the depth of the problems that could cause them 
and the good, if they refrain from it, does them. Make sure they understand in fullness, they learn fast. And the rod can be put away, and the tone of voice then, after discipline, can do a good job of controlling. Verse 16, he that oppresseth the poor, oppresseth the poor, to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Why? Because God observes them. The word poor here is the handicapped, again, uh, those that are feeble and weak, that need help, someone that tries to rip them off, as many people do the elderly in this nation. That's why you should always be on the lookout in your neighborhood for con artists that come by to try to take advantage of the loneliness or whatever the case might be of an elderly person. And don't just notice them and not do anything. Report it or do something about it yourself. Um, Christians are supposed to make a difference. If you have lost your salt where it has no flavor, it doesn't change the flavor of the your parameters, your uh, neighborhood, then what good are you? That's the teachings of Christ. Um, beware and be on the lookout for those that would oppress the feeble. Verse 17. Uh, here we come, I probably should say a word or two. Here we come to a little different set of writings. We're going to have about 30 sayings of the wise. In other words, Solomon draws in his court and it's written basically in the second party in the, of his reporting that this is what the wise say. What this in essence then brings forth is this. It's a recap of the last few chapters in repetition. Yeah, we need repetition so that we got it. We know we got it good and we don't forget. And that's what this is about, okay? So we go with it, verse 17, and it reads, uh, bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise. You listen to what they have to say. And apply thine heart unto my knowledge. In other words, we have been advised throughout the book of Proverbs, listen to wisdom, open your ear. Um, and this, in a sense, we could say, now goes from a uh, uh, the uh, personal character to a call to hear, to listen. And you always listen to counsel, and you'll be a lot better off for it. Counsel from where? God's Word. Verse 18. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. Not own you, but within thee. What does that mean? Absorbed in your mind. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. In other words, when your lips need them, that is to say, points of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, common sense, that your lips will be able to speak forth words of comfort, encouragement, and wisdom that always brings those things forth. Verse 19, that thy trust may be in the Lord. He is our trust. It is your faith that grants, his, that, that grants you his favor. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. In other words, whoever you are, Whatever your level of learning is in our Father's Word, He's made this available to you. A letter written specifically to you, full of knowledge and wisdom that brings forth patience and understanding and again, common sense. Verse 20. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? Answer, of course He has. I hope you've enjoyed them. I hope you've helped many of them within you, that is to say, in your mind, whereby on recall you can bring it forth, letting God's Word guide your footsteps in life. Why? So that you're successful. Being in good standing with our Father, inasmuch as He always gives the victory, should head you in the right direction. Verse 21 that I might make thee know the certainty, absolute certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. That is the, that is the purpose of one that lives in the word, that is to say, taking the advice and counsel of the word, 
And then when some person, when God helps you, and then someone that is um, in need of help comes to you, words, advice, counsel, you're able to impart it to them. It grows. It's uh, not a dead thing. It's very alive, the word is, even that that is in your mind. And when your lips speak those words of encouragement and sound advice, and when you repeat the advice of God's word, then certainly it is sound, and it will bring comfort and blessings. Don't ever forget that. Verse 22. Rob not the poor. This means a needy person. Now, this is not a handicapped person. The word poor here is a different word than poor back in verse 16. It means here, don't, don't rob the needy person. He needs everything he's got. Because he, don't rob the poor, rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. That is to say, those that are in dire need. Um, don't try, you know, that anyone that will rip off a person in need, I don't really have any words for them. That's, um, there are so many honest ways to make a, a living, a, a sustaining um, substance to gain it, then certainly why would someone want to rip off the needy? Verse 23, for the Lord will plead their cause. He stands good for them and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. In other words, there are no unsolved robberies. God knows who you are, if you happen to fit that category, and he's gonna take it out of you. Whatever you thought you gained, he will charge you probably about tenfold and give you a good thrashing in life uh, for discomfort that you deserve. In a sense, um, I want to pick my words wisely. In a sense, there is a prison that you cannot see. A prison being a place of correction. God can put you in prison in your own home. That is by, by uh, putting stumbling blocks in your path if you rob the weak and the poor, that uh, you will suffer as though you were in confinements. God is able to do that. I believe that with all my heart, with my body, mind, and soul, that God stands good for those that think they get away with so much, they get away with nothing. Verse 24, make no friendship with an angry man. And the Hebrew is very strong in this. It means it means a master of anger. That means somebody that's, that is uh, a master of anger to the point that there is a bit of insanity, that, and there is with anger. And with a furious man thou shalt not go. All it is is trouble. Uh, you even want to be very careful even trying to assist someone like this. Especially you don't want to make a friendship. That is to say, to socialize or bring him into the midst of your inner family because he's trouble. And just as a bad, one bad apple in a barrel will spoil the whole barrel if you allow it, he will spoil your whole family. 25. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. In other words, it will be a snare to you soul. It'll test your patience, your own anger, and many other things. So you just have to, to um, control those things, all right? And again, I repeat, make no friendship. Uh, it, it, a Christian can walk wherever they want to. They don't have to steer clear of an angry person by any means. But don't take him into your confidence or your bosom. Verse 26. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. And the next verse goes with that. Let's continue on to it. Verse 27. If thou haste, if thou hast rather nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? In other words, be very careful who you sign a note with as you being their guarantee or, uh, or, or their, um, uh, you go their bail uh, because 
they're not going to probably change unless you know they've had a change of heart and then they come and take your bed because he's no good. It's, you like doing that? You know, it's, uh, there's no need for you to suffer for someone else's sins. And in a way, God is warning you here that this is one good way and one of the very few ways that one person can suffer for another person's sins. And that's to go surety for them. That's a legal term meaning to stand good for, to shake hands on it and say, yeah, if he doesn't pay it, I will. Get ready. You will. Verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Uh, I like to teach this in two ways. It is true that you should be very interested in uh, the ancient landmarks of your people. Let's just say their migrations, where they, where they originally came from, where they traveled to. This is one reason we do documentaries, is whereby we find these signs of the people by the languages in which they have chiseled into stone. And the stones speak and allow you to do that. It's important because your heritage is, leads directly to the Father. And if that thread is cut somewhere along the way, then you truly lose the strong evidence of your being a actual child of God, not to mention the fact that uh, various peoples, as it is written in prophecy, have things to do and they are responsible for. It's difficult to fulfill those if someone has moved the landmark and you're just a person and you don't know anything about the um, heritage that God has promised you. That was why God hated Esau, because he didn't care about his heritage, which meant ultimately he didn't care about God. And, um, okay, verse 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? Question. Have you seen a man that's really good, that he's diligent, he watches detail, and he runs a very good uh, business? Then it continues, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. That is to say, he's going places. If you um, operate a business, whatever it is, see that you give service with courtesy and integrity. And uh, that draws back to the 11th verse of this chapter, if you'll remember. It will gain you everything in business. And once you promise service, always give it. And um, you will have repeat business, things of this nature. See that you take care of those that trusted you enough. A good name is better than many things. A good name is better than a than a lot of things when you're in business. A bad name, uh, advertisement by word of mouth is something that gets you repeat business. Money that simply you advertise to get the first time comer, that's one time business. If you don't treat that customer right or that associate or whatever you wish to call them, they're not coming back. So you lose and have cost yourself that word of mouth because of your good service, your good character, your good name, uh, you lose that business. And probably the sadder part of that is, if they're not treated right, they give you advertising all right by word of mouth, and it ain't good. That means they can drive more business away than you can pull back in again with money uh, of advertising. Better to have free advertising by word of mouth. It's the best advertising there is in business, vocation, or anything else. Okay, so um, uh, look, we find a man that is diligent, and if you are thinking of starting something new, a vocation, business, what have you, and take your counsel and advice and example from him rather than somebody that's a flop, all right? Okay, chapter 23, those words of wisdom, all right, but now we kind of get back to personal character again. And, of course, wisdom always has to do with all these uh, things. Verse 1 reads, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. 
or I would rather have translated, who is before thee? I mean, here you said many people, if they were to be invited and they were to be able to sit at the head table, picture a convention, if you will, they would feel pretty, you know, pretty important. But you never want to forget that every move you make in the eyes of a CEO, a king, a ruler, or whatever the case might be, uh, you can do yourself more harm than good if you don't have good character. Verse 2, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. In other words, if you're going to pig out and um, before him, you're, you are cutting your own throat. It doesn't mean actually do this. It's just saying you're, you're cutting your own self down if you're not careful. So you want to use wisdom. And this is especially one of those times if, if you think, well, I don't know very much, then keep your mouth shut and nobody else will know it. All right? Uh, be discreet. Use wisdom. Verse 3. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat, or they are meat that can bring deceit to you. It's put in a way, in an idiom, that you could liken this ruler to a fire. All right? You're invited to the head table, and you can do a lot of good there. It's like with a fire. If you're cold, and you don't get too close to the fire, it's a comfort. But if you put your hand in the fire, you're gonna get burned. And that's the way it is with a ruler. You wanna be very, your um, upper echelon, we'll call it, of your vocation. Be very careful. It would, better, it would be better that you appeared wise by keeping your mouth shut than to, um, be a gluttonous uh, one with words or whatever that you put your hand and also your head in the fire. Verse 4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Now, labor not to be rich what? The way the world gets it. All right? You want to be rich, but you want it with God's blessings and you want it to be... Uh, God's benefits and blessings that make you rich, what by serving him using his wisdom. Your own wisdom, which is to say worldly wisdom, um, is sought by many people without even consulting the Father. That's a mistake. You should always ask God's blessings on whatever it is you do and prayerfully seek his counsel, even from his word, as to how you should act and react to any given situation. Um, it is, if one uses one's own wisdom, if they are not careful, it's kind of human nature that everyone thinks riches brings happiness. Oh yes. If I was as rich as so-and-so, I would have happiness. I'm sorry, that's not true. Riches also bring unhappiness if you're not geared mentally to take care of it. It can bring a great deal of unhappiness. So you need to understand with wisdom what happiness is rather than seeking man's own wisdom's way of gaining riches because it's not going to do you any good. Um, first of all, if you get rich in the world, a lot of people think selling drugs on a corner driving a big flashy car really makes them somebody they're rich and they're happy no they're not they're criminals and they will be had sooner or later so what's the what then is the answer to that particular verse seek it from god and in god and do it with god's wisdom not wisdom of the world which is what man's uh, common man's wisdom would be verse 5 Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Question. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Who's in heaven? Well, our Father. And he can rip off... Uh
Uh, he can put holes in your bucket as quick as you can fill the bucket up, and he will see that it takes wings and flies away. That is to say, your ill-gotten gains from the wisdom of the world, especially when you... Uh, God is a jealous God. He likes to be thought of. He likes for you to uh, know that he exists and that you at least give him the time of day. Uh, example, if you have a good friend and they pass by you in the morning, say, five or six times and never even speak to you, as though you didn't exist, as though you were in a non-entity, how would you feel about it? it make you feel good to somebody you know and love to walk by and not even speak to you? Well, God doesn't like to be ignored either. You can at least let him know you love him. That is to say if you want his blessings, or there's a lot you've got that's going to fly away. Think about it. Verse 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Um, neither desire thou his dainty meats. Don't be uh, envious or jealous of someone that has something. Uh, be thankful for them. I'm talking about those that have something because of God's blessings, because God blesses them, their work, their vocation, their character, their family. Don't be envious of that. And um, eat not uh, the bread of uh, him that hath an evil eye. Why? Because you're going to find somebody that is envious, that is jealous, and they will also be envious and jealous of you when you move in close or if you should gain something, um, there you would be, okay? Don't desire that. Things of the world will not give you peace of mind. Gain peace of mind first, and then things of the world, riches, example, will not fly away. Verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he estimates himself in and as he meditates upon himself, that's what he is. No more, no less. And that's not difficult to understand. That's how you discern people. God's trying to help you to discern people. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Meaning, um, he will prove what he really is if you discern and watch. And um, an evil, jealous, envious person is a troublemaker. Another form of human nature that can spring up and bite you if you're not able to discern it in the character of a being. That's why you're studying personal character here, so that you can uh, discern or evaluate characters as to what relationship you allow them to, um, uh, to um, socialize or have intercourse with your family. Conversation is what I'm talking about because they can mislead children or anything else, anyone else. Verse 8. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. This is an idiom that means if you do, if you participate in all this, you're going to lose it. Just like uh, the expression, if a man had a nice meal and he vomits, he loses it. He loses everything. Well, that's what God is saying in rather a graphic way, how that he'll see that you lose it. Verse 9, speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Now, this is one point in Proverbs that um, I, I want you to weigh that well. I want, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something. I'm going to separate male and female here for a moment. Um, uh, there are fools in both species, all right, female and male. Now, it is taught by man that a woman 
especially in the New Testament, and especially by many so-called preachers, a woman must submit herself to a man. What if he's a fool? You can't make that statement. You have to be mature in your knowledge and wisdom from God's Word to tell a wise woman, I'll use this example, analogy, to, to submit herself to a fool. And not only does God say, don't speak to one, but here man many times says she's got to submit to one. And it is a sin for a wise person to submit, speak, or act under the uh, guidance of a fool. So you have to use a little common sense. And um, I know, I, I can see the revolving revs right now. How dare he? Well, I dare. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells a woman what she should do if she happens to be married to a fool, okay, under certain circumstances. And yes, the Christian way is, if possible, set the good example. But um, um, you can't submit to a, to a fool when you're not even supposed to speak into the ears of a fool. So be very careful when you... Uh, weigh out and pass on judgments that can bring nothing but unhappiness because you go counter to God's Word thinking you're right in there teaching the good old Word. Think about it. It's only common sense. Well, what then do you advise? I always counsel that a marriage is 50-50 and you'd better find someone of like mind before you get uh, serious about shaking hands or giving the surety, that's the guarantee, that you're going to be together. It's wonderful when two people realize that wisdom comes from God, not from man, not from the earth, I mean, uh, the ways of the world. Verse 10, remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. Don't you remove any landmarks and don't you rip off the orphans, okay? Those that are fatherless. And uh, there are many fatherless, uh, that is to say orphans that are orphaned, that have orphaned themselves or made themselves orphans because they won't even say good morning, Father. So they offer, uh, they orphan themselves away from Almighty God. Now that, that is the spiritual aspect to this particular proverb. Don't forget your heritages and the promises of God. That's where your true wealth comes from. The true riches and peace of mind in this life come from your heritage of your true father, which is to say your heavenly father. And you begin dallying with the ways of the world and removing those landmarks of his promises to you, then he's not going to be nice to you. By not being nice, I mean he's going to ignore you. You're going to call and he's not going to listen until you get your ducks in a row, until you get your house in order. Uh, that is to say, submitting to him and at least loving him enough to say, good morning, I love you, Father. It's a nice day. It's a day the Lord has made. And the Lord, will uh, he respects that. And it makes his day. But there is only one way that you can find total peace of mind and be successful in this world, and that is to understand the promises and the blessings God has and the heritage he has given you. You are his child and he owns everything. How much of it would you like to have? You have to go through him to receive it. And you can't con him. You have to love him, and he in turn, in love, uh, gives you the promises and peace of mind that you seek in the very landmarks and heritage that he has set forth for you. Again, I will repeat, and it seems that repetition is necessary. Um, sometimes to me, it um, can be a little slow and a little boring, but it is something, that, and it probably does to you, but it's something we need 
to remind us of those landmarks. Though it be a landmark you cannot see, it is very real. And there's no success without it. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. And your father puts it so because he loves you. He truly does. So how do I not remove the landmarks? By opening the letter he has written to you that marks well the landmarks, the border markers of the heritage, what you must do, what you must believe, but most of all, who you must love. And that is the Father, not yourself. One, can one love themselves? Well, if they're doing God's will and he's blessing them, one could be satisfied with themselves, but love God, for it is through that landmark or that heritage or that promise that your uh, self-satisfaction, what we would call peace of mind, come into being. True wisdom is to take that that is difficult for some and simplify it whereby all can understand it. Because our Father is very natural. If it isn't natural, it's not from Him. That's a good rule of the thumb to utilize. I would think everybody wanted His blessings. Then if you want them, don't ignore Him. Don't act like He isn't in your life. If you claim He is, why don't you speak to Him? Well, I do every weekend. That's not often enough, my friend. Not often enough at all. Doesn't hurt to even speak to him while you're working. Come up on, hit a stump, hey, ask him to for a little help in the old gray matter up here on how to get around it, over it, under it, through it, or run it, or, or crush it. He's there to help. So don't ignore him or you deserve no help because you just removed the landmark, the connection between you and the Heavenly Father who has created all things and owns all things and you want to be rich? Who is rich? He that has that line and landmark that has your name on it, this is my set of promises and property. You see, he's given that to you a long time ago, but you've got to polish it up occasionally. The landmark. I'm talking about the truth of the heritage. And act like a son or a daughter instead of acting like a, a, a human being that's been turned loose in the world with no knowledge other than the things of the world. Recognize him. That's very important. Recognize him and at least speak to him with love. Let him know you do love him. And open the path where blessings can begin to flow into your life and you will see a great re, uh, improvement in your association in all uh, the veins of life. It's better to be happy than sad. Think about it. Happiness is with your father. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered and the mark of the beast tape. What is this mark of the beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. 
If the Spirit moves and you have a question, share it. We can no longer answer all questions because of so many millions of homes we go into around the world. We'll take a handful, yours could be there, who knows. And those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, uh, you, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always that pleasure to hear from you. Got a prayer request? He's your father. Do you acknowledge him when he's in your life, in your home, your vocation, wherever you are? Then all you got to do is talk to him. And you'll have a lot better day when you do. Think about it. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch, heal in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's get into some questions and answers here. Hopefully we'll have some answers for the questions. And this is going to be from Gaffney in South Carolina. Dear Pastor Murray, I enjoy your teaching, and my question is, when do you think the end of time will be? P.S. I am 11 years old and you're the best pastor I ever had. Well, God bless you. You know, you may be the best student I've ever had. And we're both children of God and, and we should be, you know, with our heritage in good standing. I love you for that. Thank you for wanting to study. The, uh, when do you think the end of time will be? Well, we know that Father has a specific moment, and we know Gaffney from the parable of the fig tree, which I would, I would uh, think that probably you were familiar with. He said that's a generation in which all the things that are written will come to pass that pertain to this dispensation of time. And you'll read that in the 13th chapter of Mark. And that is also that great chapter that, um, that lets the elect Christians, that is to say Christians who know the truth, know exactly what's going to happen to them all through the seven trumps because seven things are given and it is the seven seals. It creates an interlock of exactness in time being recognized by the person by the events that transpire rather than having some date set. So watch those events as they transpire because that generation is living and that means the end of time is going to be before that passes away. That is to say the end of this dispensation, we're going to be here forever, all right? Uh, Jan from Minnesota. Even after the miracle of being changed into spiritual bodies at the beginning of the millennium, how can people still not believe? Even after some of the dead show up there to be taught, won't they, con won't they convince people? Is memory erased again? It's an honor to be in your pasture. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and. It, it, is, it is amazing, it amazes me that how someone could see Christ face to face and hear he and the elect teach as the millennium chapters even in, in Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 44 of the Old Testament tell us exactly what's going to happen.